Awesome. I'm going to talk about the other Will Smith. Now, what you're looking at is what many scholars call the birthplace of modern geology, high atop the central tower of York Minster uh, in northern England, which ironically is probably about the furthest place from the ground you could get in northern England at the time, because they had no Ferris wheels, but <laughs> that will come later. So the year was 1794. But of course, to understand why this was the birth of geology, we kind of have to go back a little bit before that. <laughs> the date is October 23rd, the year 4004 BC. That's before Christ. At the, at the uh, nippy hour of 6 o'clock in the morning, according to the 18th century Archbishop James Usher, this was the precise day and moment that the world had been brought into existence. Science, perhaps science, yeah. So or not, that's right. So wrong again, Aristotle, and of course, uh, and of course, Archbishop Usher. Call back. So this is the world, the dogmatic world into which uh, William Smith was born in the year 1767 in Oxfordshire, England. Now, at the age of eight, his dad died, and so he was forced to go to work at the family. Uh, at the, it's hilarious. At the, the, was forced to go to work, um, as we often are, in the family dairy farm, and of course later on in the coal fields of Somerset. Now, the funny thing about dairy farms in Somerset is that they're all strewn with these little rocks that are all the same size, and each of these rocks weighs about one pound, uh, and this makes them very useful for selling butter, and so. Uh, Smith developed this fat, this weather called pound stones. Now, the interesting thing about this is that you, uh, uh, there are fossils, but he didn't know it at the time, and these are actually the origin. Uh, he knew there were fossils, but he didn't know the origin. Uh, but years later, it turned out that um, the, um, uh, it turns out that the, do, 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 they were all due to the fact that the, these actually were, oh, speak, speaking ahead here. These, these are actually the solidified, petrified remains of sea urchins. And here they were, 300 feet above sea level, 100 miles from the nearest shoreline. And here he is picking these up. So he got really fascinated with these things. And so as he was being you know, lowered into mines and cutting shafts, he would take fossil samples. And it was really great because he was fascinated. He would draw pictures of them. And so this is art and science at the same time. So this is nice. So he took all these great things. So now as a young coal miner, he would be lowered by candlelight, which seems extremely dangerous, but he would be lowered in a, by candlelight into these shafts, some of them 9,000 feet deep, and he would take note of what was around him. And what he noticed is that the rocks were always, uh, that the rocks were always in the same layer, and they all had their own particular types of fossils in them, and that these fossils were, were never in different layers. Every layer had its own particular type of fossil. And so this is where he got the realization that became his epiphany, that by following these fossils, you could actually trace the layers of rock as they dipped and rose around England. And what he would say is that these strata always appeared in the same order. First the chalk, and then the, and, and then, yes, then the, for <laughs> science, and then, then the olite sandstone, and then ultimately the seam of coal. And so using fossils, Smith said, he said that one could forecast the precise succession of the beds underground. And if they could be forecast, they could be mapped. Yes. Awesome, yes. So anyway, so now, if only he could prove it. So here's the trouble. So, well, the good thing is that the Industrial Revolution was now full steam ahead, and steam, steam required coal. Now, a single pack horse can only carry, as you know, about uh, two, 250 pounds worth of coal, and that a wagon on a soft road can carry only 1,200 pounds of coal, but a barge on a canal can transport Ships, a ship in the form of ours, that's right, could transport 50 tons pulled by a single horse. And so this was a great opportunity for profit, and so they formed the Somerset Coal Canal Company and hired William Smith at the age of 18 as a surveyor. And this gave him the perfect opportunity to test out his theory by literally and laterally slicing all the way through England. I 
So, so even better, even better is that the, uh, even better than that was that at 25, he got hired to go on the stagecoach with all his other, with the, these two other older colleagues of his all around England. And he, of course, his, his partners would be in the stagecoach and he would be actually on top. He would be, uh, he would have the, the, the driver to the right of him and the guy with the blunderbuss to the left of him. Uh, it's England. And then, uh, so riding blunderbuss, yes. And so he would jump off and he would occasionally go hammer, as we geologists love to do, we like to take our hammers and just start hammering at things and then take our bottle of hydrochloric acid and pour it on shit. And uh, and, yeah, 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 lick lick the rock, listen to it, there we go. And then uh, it's great. And so he was having a good old time doing this, collecting samples and going around. And so this was his, uh, this is his big deal. So what is interesting, hold on, I'm trying to, uh, what's this do? There we go. Okay. So anyway, so he was jumping down and collecting these samples. So this brings our hero back to where we are at the beginning here. So now upon, upon arriving in York, uh, he and the others climbed the 290 steps up to the top of York Minster Tower to see the view where you could see for 30 miles in each direction. And he was so excited by what he saw, he called his friends up and he said, he said, Mr. Palmer, do you see this? I mean, look, you can tell by the contour that that, that, is, oh, that is the chalk. That's the smooth train. That's the chalk. And then to the right there, that is the, that's the blue limestone. And then the red, and then the red sandstone and the marl and, the, and then the coal. And these are all laid down one on top of the other with the youngest on the top and the oldest to the bottom. And this cycle is repeated. And then for, and so for some reason, it was twisted to the side. Spoiler alert, plate tectonics, but we're not going to hear about that till 1967. <laughs> Twist it to the side. And so what happens is that the oldest rocks are to the northwest and the youngest rocks are to the southeast. And so as you're walking west, we're actually walking through time backwards. And this cycle is repeated all throughout the kingdom. Epiphany. So this is the moment that Palmer wrote in his, di- in his uh, diary that uh, the scientists all agree that this was the moment in which modern geology was born. Now, Smith had a fat salary. He was 25 years old and was making buku bucks, and so he didn't buy a lot of clothes. He bought a lot of houses. Um, now, the thing about this is that uh, this place was his pride and joy right here. This is Tucking Mill House uh, near the city of Bath. Uh, it had a small lake and a waterfall. Um, and uh, it was very nice. It's 17 acres. Yeah. So th- now his, his mortgage was substantial. It was like 1,300 pounds that he had to pay annually to a man by the, the owner by the name of Mr. Connolly. That would eventually be his downfall. Because the trouble all began on the 5th of June, 1799, when William Smith was abruptly and unceremoniously fired from his job at the Somerset Coal Canal Company. He never had a steady job again. Now, he had no degree and he had no connections, and, but the one thing that he knew how to do was travel. So he spent the next 15 years just bumming around, chasing odd jobs, traversing the country mostly by foot. And then everywhere that he went, he would hammer things with his rocks and he would take samples and pour hydrochloric acid on them and take samples. And the ultimate dream, of course, was creating a map of England's underbelly. Yes. So in 1808, he happens to meet and marry his 17-year-old wife, but uh, he rarely... But see, he rarely mentions her in his diaries except for four times to say that she had black hair, pale skin, and was increasingly depressed. (laughs) Goth as fuck. That's all I can say. So over the years, he painstakingly collected and classified 2,657 fossils. He even had special cases built so that he could display them in the appropriate angle and layer to which they were found to represent the strata under England. Science. Now, and here it is, maps. So so Sir Joseph Banks, uh, who met him during his canal days, uh, convinced him to finally start drawing his map. 
And in 1815, Smith published his geographical map of England, which he called the delineation of strata of England and Wales with the part of Scotland. <laughs> Maps. Now, 400 copies were produced, and most of these, almost all of these, he hand-colored himself. So quite a lot of work. And it is a lot of work because the actual size of this was nine feet tall by six feet wide. <clears throat> yeah, big map. Now, the interesting thing is that Smith colored these different bodies of rock in the strata uh, which are, where they were closest to the surface, and they were reflecting the natural colors of the rock formations, like green from the chalk and, and sedimentary olite for a rich shade of yellow and red for the red marlstone, uh, a brickish red, and for the outcrops of limestone, you know, a dirty blue, and of course, black for the coal. And the whole point of this is that you could look back at this, and it was like you were looking with x-ray vision into the crust of the earth, and no one had ever seen anything. It was very remarkable. So remarkable that Smith's map was 95% accurate. It remains this accurate compared to the current geological map of Great Britain. Now, similarly, it's so detailed, it's, uh, it's really ingenious how he did this. You know, but while the modern geological map on this side, of course, took over a thousand people to do, and modern satellite technology and imaging systems, the one on the left, the one created by Smith, was done over 20 years, almost 20 years to produce, and was entirely the work of one man working always alone. And there it is. So, now, now we come to the first villain in the story. So, shortly after Smith's map was finished, ooh, yeah, his, so he was, uh, he, he was visited by this gentleman, uh, George Bellis Greeno, a 30-year-old member of parliament who actually had his, made his money, uh, made his, inherited the wealth from his grandfather, who was a snake oil salesman in England many years earlier. And so, uh, so he was now the president of the very popular club that he formed called the Geological Society of London, which ironically refused to grant Smith membership due to his lack of education and social stature, and that he wasn't of the upper crust. I approve. Thank you. So, uh, so... So, so Greeno, decide, Greeno decided that he was going to make his own map, but in doing so, he brazenly plagiarized Smith's map, of which he bought four copies and made notes on them. And, but, of course, Greeno's map had the seal of the Geological Society of London on it, and also he undercut Smith's price by half, and this decimated his sales. Very soon, Smith became ruined completely uh, to make ends meet. Uh, Smith actually agreed to sell his entire fossil collection of 2,657 fossils to the British Museum, to the National History Museum of London, uh, and he even had to carry them to the museum from his home uh, on his back in six round trips uh, because he couldn't afford the hundred pounds it took to pay for the shipping. So then one day it gets worse. Mr. Connolly, who I mentioned before, was the owner of the Tucking Mill House. Um, called on William Smith to make his annual payment. But being unable to pay or even willing to negotiate, uh, Smith was sentenced to go to the King's Bench Debtors Prison in Suffolk, England, on Clink Street, which ironically is where the term clink comes from. Surprisingly enough, is Clink Street. So anyway, so everything that Smith owned was confiscated and sold in order to cover the debt. And he was compelled to live as a homeless person for, the, for many, many years. His wife went mad uh, with nymphomania being just one of her afflictions. Goth as fuck. And uh, Smith soon fell ill, and he actually had few friends, and despite all the work, his work had no merit, and he had no income. But finally, in 1831, uh, Smith is working up in Yorkshire for some dude digging a drainage ditch, and this guy, who's this rich aristocrat, recognizes him and says, says, 
I say, old man, aren't you the one who made this beautiful map that I own? And I was like, oh, yes, that was me. It's like, well, that's fantastic. People should know what you're doing. And so this man was the name of, by the name of Dr. William, William Fitton. And William Fitton made sure that people knew who he was. So he wrote to Parliament. He talked to other influential people. And he even wrote to the Geological Society itself and said, hey, guys, you need to recognize. You wouldn't believe he was in my backyard digging a drainage ditch. And so... The Geological Society of London, who had denied membership to Smith for decades, relented. And upon pressure from sympathetic members of Parliament, the Society awarded Smith, now at the age of 62, the very first Wollaston Medal in recognition for his achievement. So, in fact, the Society's former president, uh, Mr. Greeno, he resigned in shame, and the Society completely admitted the plagiarism. In fact, they renamed the Wollstone Medal in 1977 to the William Smith Medal. Uh, congratulations. And the current president called him the, uh, the father of English geology. The next day, he was asked to sit for this handsome portrait right here. And, uh, and then within days of receiving the medal, thanks to a petition of, from a panel of scientists, uh, King William IV actually granted William Smith a pension to live out the rest of his life in, uh, in comfort, and then, of course, to even extend to the needs of his widow when Smith himself eventually died at the age of 67. So this stone monument to Smith is near his home uh, in Somerset. Uh, is, uh, is a, a marker of his epiphany, and it shows the rocks that he found in the same order they were found, the chalk, the marble, the great olite, inferior olite, blue lias, I'm sure you recognize the white lias, and of course the pen and stone. And uh, when he was accepting his medal, uh, he was a very humble man, and he would say, said to the crowd that, you know, uh, Sir Isaac Newton was actually born on the same sandstone that I was, and uh, it's amazing. I wonder how the science of geology might have changed if Newton had looked down at the ground instead of up at the apple. And so I, before I too hide my head among the crowd, I would like to offer a toast to the world's very first rock star, William Smith. Thank you. Let's hear one more time for tonight's speakers. Uh, please do feel free to stick around, uh, talk to our speakers if you can find them in the crowd, and again, about all of those details, all of that stuff that went into the chaos and why and how some of them became those epiphanies. Next up, we have fear. We have uh, stories about things that give us chills, goosebumps, and go bump in the night. That will be on October 8th. Discounted advance tickets are available at the merch table. Along with your very own adventure, Harvey. Right. Uh, there are still speaking spots available for fear, so once again... Hop on Otsalon.com slash speak and pitch your story ideas to us. Uh, be sure to join our email list. You get notifications about all of this, all the new events, all the cool stuff that we're doing. We do have uh, special little stuff for our members, so be sure to become one. Uh, between all salons, you can find us on UtwitFace, uh, all the normal places, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. Also Instagram. Uh, find us there. You'll get all the cool stories, everything that's going on behind the scenes. Like I said, please consider joining if you enjoy this event. We are still reliant on your generosity. So please give generously. Become a member. Support this incredible event and all of these amazing speakers, right? You can go online for more details or... Go to the merch table. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. I'm gonna let you finish. Oh, wait. I have one more thank you to extend. I'd like to thank Miles for taking on the bonkers amount of work that it takes to put this all together. And 
As a little thank you, we have a speaker's book for you. Oh, my goodness. Ta-da. And you get your very own Harvey Piffany. So thank you for all of your work. And thank you, audience. This is, this is a community project of volunteers. We could not do it with a lot of volunteer help. So thank you, volunteers. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Miles. I'm jumping in with one more thing. So when we first started this, we lured our first 10 fellows uh, by giving them a shiny lapel pin and extracting a promise from them that they would give at least three talks. And at some point, they I mean, it worked. And they did it, and they came back. But at some point, we realized that um, what we wanted was to extend the community of this project more by not just having a small group of people curating the talks, but by extending that into our fellowship, which is now over 75 people. One more tonight, which means we have another level, which is the curator, and we have the curator's pin, and this is for you, Miles. It's just like hundreds of hours of volunteering and a bunch of stress, but it's totally worth it because the pin. I feel different. (laughs) Uh, Once again, join us, this wonderful community of weirdos at Something Weird on Facebook. Please come stick around and talk to our speakers and talk to us, anyone with either one of these, which feels weird. I haven't had this before. Or another one of these beautiful Harvey lapel pins for our adventure Harvey, or anything that looks like someone who knows what they're doing. Please, please come find us and talk to us about this amazing thing. Please support us. Thank you all. Good night.